latest updates on Russia-Ukraine conflict. Russia advances in battle for eastern Ukraine city as NATO warns the war could last for years. Russian officials say U.S. has robbed Ukraine of sovereignty by establishing biolabs. Top EU human rights official is on a fact-finding mission in Ukraine. Boris Johnson says Britain must resist Ukraine fatigue. Russia expert warns of Putin pressuring Belarus to deploy troops in Ukraine. Other main stories in today's program. Japan deploys self-defense fleet to Indo-Pacific with eye on China. French President Emmanuel Macron loses absolute majority in parliament. Despite the wonder threat, migrants still dream of England. New technique could help head off coral bleaching. Hello, it's Ying Trang again and welcome to World News on FBNC. After failing to take the capital Kiev early in the war, Russian forces have focused on trying to take complete control of the Donbass. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has said the battle for the eastern city of Sevilla Rodonetsk will decide the fate of Donbass. As the fighting continues, Russia said on Sunday it seized a village near Sevilla Rodonetsk, while the head of NATO predicted the war could last for years. Russia's defense ministry said it had won material kind, a settle of fewer than 800 people before the war began. Russian state news agency TASS reported that many Ukrainian fighters had surrendered there. For their part, Ukraine's military said Russia had partial success in the area, which is about 6 kilometers southeast of Sevilla Rodonetsk. Russia also said on Sunday its offensive to win Severodonetsk itself was proceeding successfully. Luhansk Governor Sahir Gaidai told Ukrainian TV that fighting make evacuations from the city impossible, but that all Russian claims that they control the town are a lie. They control the main part of the town, but not the whole town. Gadai told Ukraine TV that among the communities around Severodonetsk, a Russian attack on Torskivka, 35 kilometers south, had a degree of success. Meanwhile, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said supplying state-of-the-art weaponry to Ukrainian troops would boost the chance of freeing its eastern region of Donbass from Russian control, according to Germany's Bild am Sonntag newspaper. We must prepare for the fact that it could take years. We must not let up in supporting Ukraine, Sotenberg was quoted as saying. Uncertainty has surrounded the fate of hundreds of fighters captured by Russian forces in May after a month-long siege of Ukraine's southeastern port of Mariupol. Moscow said at the time they were moved to breakaway Russian back in entities in eastern Ukraine. In a related development, Russia's state news agency TASS reported on Sunday that two top commanders of fighters who defended the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol have been transferred to Russia for investigation. Citing an unnamed Russian law enforcement source, TASS said late on Saturday that a Siltov staff, a Palama, a deputy commander of the Azov Battalion, and Sehi Volinsky, the commander of the 36th Marine Brigade of the Ukrainian Aimed Forces, were moved to Russia. They had been transferred by special forces officers from Donetsk to conduct investigative activities with them. Other officers of various Ukrainian units were also transported to Russia, TASS cited the source as saying. The Azov Battalion is an all-volunteer infantry military unit which formed in 2014 as an extreme right-wing volunteer militia to fight Russian-backed separatists and the 36th Marine Bridget Unit were key in defending the steelworks. Earlier this month, Ukraine said its intelligence services were in communication with the captured Azovstal steelworks fighters. Kiev is seeking the handover of all the fighters in a prisoner swap with Moscow, but some Russian lawmakers want some of the fighters put on trial. 
Russian agencies reported in early June that more than 1,000 Azov Sol uh, fighters were transferred to Russia to undisclosed locations for investigation. The United States has deprived Ukraine of its sovereignty by establishing secret biological laboratories in the country. Irina Yarovaya, deputy chairwoman of the Russian state Duma, has said Yarovaya is also the co-chair of the Parliamentary Commission on Investigation into Activities of the U.S. Biological Laboratories in Ukraine. She said the fact that the U.S. did not involve Ukraine in the work of these uh, clandestine labs or share any of the labs research showed that Ukraine and other named countries where a similar labs had been set up have been stripped of their sovereignty. It is horrible that the U.S. Pentagon established such a secret laboratory on the territory of another country. Most importantly, the establishment of such highly classified labs in other countries is built upon the complete loss of sovereignty of those countries, as they are unable to access any contents of the research and relevant information from the labs. As for Ukraine, after the US set up a series of secret biolabs there, we have seen the destruction of the health system, the complete destruction of primary health care, vaccination system, and the increase in infections from epidemic diseases, including diseases that had not been typical in Ukraine at any point in history. Yarovaya said the U.S. had a long history of trying to assess military biotechnology and that U.S. military personnel had obtained research results from inhuman experiments conducted by Japanese Army Units 731 and 100 during World War II and burdened the Army and scientific personnel behind these war crimes in its bid to develop its own biological and chemical weapons. We can seriously assert that the U.S. has created an online bio-reconnaissance system to try to control the birth rate and lifespan of people in a country. This is a dangerous ambition and a dangerous secret project. The complaint files from Russia and materials provided for the international community, including the agreement that the U.S. has established biolabs in Ukraine, show that Ukraine has totally lost its sovereignty, whereas the beneficiary is the Pentagon. Yarovaya also said the U.S. continues to research the most dangerous pathogens, including pestis, anthranosis, and smallpox. European Union top human rights officials said on Sunday war crimes committed in Ukraine will be thoroughly investigated. Ukraine last month declared 15,000 suspected war crimes had been reported since the war began. Russia, however, denies committing war crimes or targeting civilians during what it calls a special military operation. I am here for a couple of days uh, to see and hear at first hand uh, the human rights violations and the violations of international humanitarian law uh, which have been caused uh, by the Russia's war of aggression uh, in Ukraine. When we talk about war crimes, we talk not only about those who committed the crime, the direct crime, on the spot and in location. They, of course, have responsibility, but we're also talking about those who are in the chain of command. If necessary, right to the very top. Uh, but that has to be pursued by investigation uh, of those who are carrying it out. Gilmore spoke after walking around ruined buildings and wrecked cars up open, a town near Kiev, which became a sense of heavy fighting early in the invasion. The open tour was designed to highlight what Ukraine and its backers say were large-scale atrocities committed by Russian troops, what German Chancellor Olaf Scholz described as the sense of unimaginable cruelty and senseless violence. Irina Venediktova, Ukraine's chief prosecutor, said in early June that more than 15,000 suspected war crimes have been reported in the country since the beginning of the Russian invasion. She told a news conference in The Hague that about 200 to 300 war crimes are committed every day. 
British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said it was important to go to Ukraine and for Britain to continue to show it is supporting Ukraine for the long haul, warning of a risk of Ukraine fatigue as the war drags on. Johnson has grown in popularity in Ukraine as Britain has poured in military and political support into Kiev during the Russian invasion. Johnson spoke as he arrived at Ralph Bryce Norton in Oxfordshire, southern England on Saturday following a surprise a visit to meet with Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, in Kiev. When Ukraine fatigue is setting in, very important to show that we're, we're with them for the long haul and uh, uh, we're giving them that a st strategic a resilience that they need. I think the, the, the crucial thing is to look at the, the problems that uh, the Ukrainians have. And it would be a catastrophe if Putin won. It would be a catastrophe if he was able to secure uh, the, the land bridge, uh, the, the, the cities in the south that he has, uh, to hold the Donbass. That's what he wants. He wants to be able to say, uh, we've got Militopol, we've got Bedyanks, we've got Mariupol, we've got all that southern belt, uh, we've got Kherson. Uh, and then close off the Donbass, and then uh, he'd love nothing more than to say, uh, you know, well, let's freeze this conflict, let's have a ceasefire like we did back in, in 2014. For him, that would be a, a tremendous victory. Johnson also offered a major training operation he believes could change the equation against the Russian invasion. The new military training program would train Ukrainian forces outside of the country, according to Johnson's officers. Each soldier would spend three weeks learning battle skills for the front line, as well as basic medical training, cyber security and counter-explosive tactics. Some members of Johnson's Conservative Party had criticized him for making the trip instead of attending a conference in Northern England, where some conservatives won traditionally opposition Labour supporting parliamentary seats for the first time in 2019. The Belarusian military is scheduled to hold mobilization training exercises this month and in July in the Gomel region, which is located on the country's southern border with Ukraine and near the capital city of Kiev. Speaking with the Express UK last Saturday, Mark Voyager of the Transatlantic Defence and Security Program at the Center for European Analysis, who is also a former advisor to the US Army, explained how these plans have put many on edge over the possibility of Belarusian troops joining the fray in the Eastern European country. These drills will cause serious concern because unfortunately Russia and its allies have consistently been using military drills as a mask to cover their aggressive actions, Voyager explained. Russia previously used training exercises as a rationale for its troop build-ups in the lead-up to its invasion of the country in late February. Roughly 150,000 soldiers were positioned along the Russian border with Ukraine before they were mobilized. In 2014, Russia massed troops near another border with Ukraine, with the government assuring that it was only trying to protect the Winter Olympics in Sochi. However, later, the troops mobilized into the region of Crimea, eventually annexing the peninsula from the country. So far, the Belarusian military has not directly participated in the invasion, but Belarus has allowed Russian forces to operate on its land, acting as an entry point into Ukraine for Russian soldiers, and a point from which the military can launch missile strikes. Belarus has long been considered one of the Russia's closest and most loyal allies on the global stage. The concern is that Putin has been trying to put pressure on Lukashenko and force him to take a more aggressive stance to launch more aggressive actions out of Belarus involving Belarusian troops. Voyer said, adding that so far we've seen the Russian troops enter Belarus and then in February they attacked Ukraine from the north. But in this case, Russia is suffering from shortages of soldiers, so any additional troops would add greatly to their potential, especially if uh, they can strike against uh, from the north, uh, potentially using Belarusian troops. 
According to Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense, three Chinese military aircraft flew into Taiwan's air defense identification zone on Saturday, marking the seventh day of intrusions this month. Taiwan has complained for years of the repeated Chinese Air Force missions into its air defense identification zone, which is not territorial airspace but a broader area it monitors for threats. Two People's Liberation Army Air Force Shenyang J-16 fighter jets and one Shanxi Y-8 anti-submarine warfare plane were tracked in the southwest corner of Taiwan's Adiz, the Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense reported. In response, Taiwan sent aircraft, issued radio warnings, and deployed air defense missile systems to track the planes. And it is, is an area that extends beyond the country's airspace where air traffic controllers ask incoming aircraft to identify themselves. So far this month, China has sent 11 aircraft into Taiwan's identification zone, including seven fighter jets and four spotter planes. Since September 2020, China has increased its use of gray zone tactics by routinely sending aircraft into Taiwan's Adiz, with most occurrences taking place in the southwest corner. In 2021, Chinese military planes entered Taiwan's Adiz on 961 instances over 239 days, according to the Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense. Gray zone tactics are defined as an effort or series of efforts beyond steady state deterrence and assurance that attempts to achieve one's security objectives without resort to direct and sizable use of force. Japan has dispatched a maritime self-defense force flotilla on a deployment to 11 Indo-Pacific countries and one foreign territory as part of a joint naval exercises with the United States and other countries undertaken to counter a more assertive China. In the annual deployment that began last Monday and will run to October 28th, the MSDF fleet will make port calls in the Pacific Island nations of the Solomon Islands, Tonga and Fiji for the first time, according to the Japanese Defense Ministry. The fleet will also take part in the Rim of the Pacific exercise, the world's largest multinational naval exercise. The Pacific Vanguard exercise involves Australia, Japan, the United States and South Korea and other drills, the ministry said. Besides New Caledonia, a French territory in the South Pacific, the 11 countries to be visited are the United States, India, Australia, the Solomon Islands, Tonga, Papua New Guinea, Palau, Vanuatu, Fiji, Vietnam and the Philippines. We would like to continue to step up our relations with these Pacific Island nations, including maintaining and strengthening FOIP, Japanese Defense Minister Nobio Kishi said at a press conference last month, referring to a free and open Indo-Pacific. Earlier this year, China and the Solomon Islands signed a security pact that would allow the deployment of Chinese military personnel as well as the docking of Chinese warships at the island. Such a move has alarmed regional maritime democracies such as Australia, Japan and the United States. French President Emmanuel Macron lost control of the National Assembly in legislative elections on Sunday, a major setback that could throw the country into political paralysis unless he is able to negotiate alliances with other parties. There is no set script in France for how things will now unfold as Macron and Assemble will seek to find a way forward to avoid paralysis. In a crushing outcome, French President Emmanuel Macron and his allies on Sunday lost their absolute majority in the National Assembly and with it control of the reform agenda. Initial projections showed Macron's centrist ensemble alliance were still set to end up with the most seats, followed by the left-wing Nupes bloc, headed by the hard-left veteran Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who called the results Sunday a rout in front of cheering supporters. But Macron and his allies would fall well short of the absolute majority they would need to control parliament. If confirmed, a hung parliament would open up a period of political uncertainty that would require a degree of power sharing among parties not experienced in France in recent decades. In another major change for French politics, Marine Le Pen's far-right reassemblement national party 
could win as much as 100 seats, the initial projections showed. Its biggest score on record. Le Pen said she wants to unite all patriots, including those on the left. Macron's ability to pursue further reform of the Eurozone's second biggest economy would hinge on his ability to rally moderates outside of his alliance on the right and left, behind his legislative agenda. Britain has agreed with Rwanda to send migrants who cross the English Channel illegally to the African country, a plan meant to deter migrants crossing from France. But in a camp near the northern French port of Calais, many still want to make the perilous journey to reach England. Migrants in this camp near the French port of Calais still hope to reach England, despite the risk of being deported to Rwanda under a new British government scheme. Britain has agreed with Rwanda to send migrants who cross the English Channel illegally to the African country. The first British flight carrying asylum seekers was due to leave on Tuesday, but it was blocked at the last minute by the European Human Rights Court. The UK government says the policy will go ahead. It's supposed to deter people from making the trip. But Ahmed from Sudan, who declined to give his family name, is still desperate to go. If they take me back to the Rwanda, I will feel that I'm a dead man because my everything which my idea which I put in my mind they have destroyed it. Yeah. Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Saturday called the EU court decision a weird last minute hiccup. But we're very confident in the in in the legality of what we're the lawfulness of what we're doing and we're going to pursue the the policy. Claire Mosley works for the Care for Calais charity which has been lobbying the British government to change tack. It's a really brutal plan. After all they've gone through to get here and get to safety, the last thing they want is to be sent back to Africa. People we talked to are really frightened of it, and I can't believe the UK government would do something like this. It's incredibly upsetting for us. Aid groups estimate that hundreds of African and Middle Eastern migrants still want to make the perilous crossing. Dozens of families are fleeing the homes in villages close to the front lines in northern Syria, turning them into virtual ghost towns with threats of a new Turkish military offensive looming. The villages of Umm al-Kaif and nearby Tal Tamir, close to the northern Syrian front line, have become ghost towns under threat of a new Turkish military offensive. They are frequently bombarded and dozens of families have fled. Turkish forces and allied Syrian rebel groups arrived on the outskirts as far back as 2019. But they have recently upped their assaults to drive out Kurdish fighters from the area, causing major damage. Those who've stayed live in constant fear of an attack. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan last month announced a new military operation in Syria to extend a 20-mile-deep safe zone along the border. He aims to oust fighters from the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces from the area. The SDF have said they are coordinating with Syrian government troops to repel any offensive. The new threats have highlighted the complex web of ties in northern Syria. Turkey considers Syrian Kurdish forces to be terrorists. But those forces are backed by Washington and have also coordinated with Syria's government and its ally Russia. Pro-government local media reported that Syrian troops, tanks and heavy weaponry deployed over the weekend in response to Turkish moves. Australian scientists have come up with a model that will help researchers quickly identify soft corals are most vulnerable to bleaching from marine heat waves, helping prioritize resources to preserve reefs. This is soft coral also known as octocorals. They're the under-researched and overlooked cousin to your classic hard coral, but no less important. A marine biologist, Rosie Steinberg, in Australia has developed a new technique to protect it better. They provide tons of food and shelter for other species. They grow really quickly, so they're good at recolonizing after a major disturbance, such as like a big cyclone or a bleaching event. Um, and honestly, they're just beautiful and they deserve all the research that hard corals get. Steinberg's technique is based on doing a soft coral health check. This identifies which corals are most in need of protection from marine heat waves. How does a health check work? The first step is to grind up wet frozen soft coral samples to create a sort of puree. You blend them down 
and then you put them in a centrifuge, which is basically a giant box that spins them super fast. And what that does is it pulls down the heaviest things, which are the algal cells, and leaves all the other stuff, like the coral protein, up in the water. And that way I could take the cells out and count them, and I could keep that water that has all the protein and see how much protein was in the corals as well. The levels of protein, cells of algae and chlorophyll all indicate how healthy the coral is. Steinberg's research shows that generally soft corals took longer to bleach than hard corals. Steinberg hopes that the ease of this new technique will encourage more scientists to include octocorals in their research, which will create a better overview of the status of reefs. She says the technique can also be used to identify the health of other marine animals that use algae. There's so many like marine animals that use algae, like there's jellyfish and there's anemones and there's sponges, there's tons of stuff, and all of them can bleach, every single one. So it is important to have these techniques that aren't just for the main species that we look at, which is hard corals, because hard corals are pretty actually surprisingly easy to test all this stuff. And that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Until next time, goodbye.